Yes, we're, we're live. Sour and Wild QA panel family get together. Um, <laughs> I'm Jeff Mello, Chief East Wrangler, uh, Bootleg Biology. We're a yeast company here in Nashville, Tennessee. We also do brewery QC services. Um, and we start off um, focus on wild yeast cultures. We have a goal of collecting wild yeast from every zip code in the entire country and are asking people to help collaborate with us so we can understand microbes out there that want to make us tasty beer. I'm Devin Bell, I'm one of the co-founders of Milk the Funk, and we do online education for all things sour and wild and bread. But not sour bread. Not sour bread. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brandon Jones, I run the uh, uh, Embrace the Funk program at Yazoo Brewing Company. I uh, also founded the website EmbraceTheFunk.com. Uh, I was a blogger for a few years before I started uh, professionally brewing. Started brewing uh, sour and wild funky beer in uh, the mid early 2000s because we couldn't we couldn't buy beer in Nashville, so um, you had to brew brew it yourself uh, at that point. So kind of taking that platform from uh, the blogging and education days and uh, transform that into uh, what was a passion project all the way into a, a professional career now. Yeah, yeah, and I am one of the founders of Milk the Funk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Dan Pixley. I'm the curator for the wiki. Uh, I probably do most of the work on the wiki, although Dave Jansen does quite a bit of work as well. Uh, I'm just a homebrewer. I've been homebrewing for about seven years. And I make just sour beers for the last five years. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, we don't have a uh, open discussion today on um, basically anything uh, sour, funky, uh, wild beer related. Um, I know there's uh, there's a lot of misconceptions on what uh, processes are, uh, what different microbes do. So um, we definitely you know want to make sure we uh, get to get to everybody's question in the room. Um, just feel free to raise your hand, and uh, one of the moderators will uh, go through the crowd and uh, and find you. <laughs> we do have our first question, though. Oh, we do? Oh, it's online question. Okay. Quiet in the back, please. <laughs> this is from Josh Kaufman. And can y'all, can all of you take a dip in Bob Sylvester's mash tun, hot tub, and send me a sample of water afterwards, asking for a friend? <laughs> yes. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to go back down tarpon. <laughs> Bob is, uh, the, Speaking of, yeah, that does bring up a good point on this, some things that Bob does um, that, that makes what their process is uh, unique, open fermentation. And uh, I know there's been a lot, uh, there's been a lot, but there has been debate on open fermentation. You know, is it, is it something that actually does anything different than is if you were to close off the fermenter and just pitch the yeast and let it go inside there? Uh, you know, this, I, you know, I've seen evidence, uh, even in bottles, the, in sensory. The, yeah, there's definitely a difference. Uh, that CO2 blanket is not a uh, is not a substitute for uh, you know for a closed vessel. So there is you know there's a definite difference even if you're still inside, like Bob's tanks or uh, old wine tanks, flat bottom wine tanks that have a um, like a, a rope pulley system on the top, and you can just remove the lid and uh, move it off to the side. So even though it is kind of you know flat bottom, but sort of Cylindrical um, up top, and you know, not a square, large open fermenter. Uh, you know, I think that he gets distinctly different esters and uh, and character out of those yeasts, um, just because there is not that um, not that uh, pressure inside of there, and it is open now. He does talk about a uh, free range um, uh, microbes, tartan springs, uh, Britannomyces, and uh, uh, the other microbes that I think he's really trying to get in his new place because. Uh, we had a conversation there earlier this year, and uh, Bob had moved uh, from his old facility, and a lot of the St. Somewhere beers had quite a bit of Britannomyces and lactic acid in them. Uh, this new facility where, where he is at, um, that native flora has not built up. 
uh, inside the uh, the wood beams inside of his uh, brew house. Yeah, so um, it's was, it was kind of neat to see that, and that to me, you know, that definitely shows you there is a difference in in a fermentation versus a closed vessel. You move it, and those native microbes aren't there, and that that influence was not happening. I think for the first few months. I'm going to continue to speak for Bob. I can say anything at this point. <laughs> we, we do have a serious question. Um, this is again from Josh Kaufman. He goes, and this was, um, he said, more suited for Jeff and Isaac. But um, he goes, is, I don't have, and I lost my glasses. Is more consistent over time to break down a wild harvested mixed culture into its constituent parts and propagate each, or keep the whole culture together and attempt to propagate each time? When dealing with a wild harvested, in this case, fruit skin place of sterile wart, culture likely containing a diverse array of microbes, how valuable is attempting to break that culture down to its constituent parts? I'm wondering if there is a gaining consistency generation to generation if each microbe is grown separately versus propagating the entire mixed culture each time. One concern I have is the inability to play, isolate all constituent microbes, thus losing complexity. Conversely, if you try to propagate the entire mixed culture each time, both the ratios of microbes and the continued existence of certain microbes in the blend might be thrown off anyway. I think it's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where to begin. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think the main crux of his question is, um, how much does the human hand um, playing with microbes, whether they're pure cultures or a diverse mixed culture, um, have in changing that um, the final number of microbes, the final population, the ratios they have. Um, and the answer is that anytime you touch it, you're going to change it, um, even when you're working with pure cultures. Um, I think there's, there's so many ways to answer that question. I would say we get a lot of mixed culture samples from people that, for the most part, um, they assume to have hundreds, thousands of yeast and bacteria, um, and we'll pull out one yeast one bacteria, um, because the dominant culture is so dominant that there might be a few other cultures in there, and there might be a few cells, um, but you would have to really dig deep into pull, pulling them out. Um, so that might be an argument for never isolating a culture. If you want to maintain a certain mix that created this wonderful flavor, um, maybe don't pull them out, because it might be really hard um, just on a you know, homebrew level to pull out a single cell of that one yeast that might be contributing to something that's really unique. Um, that being said, you can't really study a culture unless you isolate it out and make it pure. So at Bootleg, we do isolate cultures, wild yeast cultures that get sent to us. Because we can study them alone, um, we can bank them better, uh, we can guarantee um, certain characteristics over time. Um, but that being said, I think you can do whatever works best for your process and what your end goal is. Um, if you want to see what a culture does over time, take a sample over time. Um, Take it two weeks into fermentation, you're going to see a high amount of sap cultures. Take it a month to six weeks into fer fermentation, and you might see a higher proportion of wild yeast cultures. Um, look at it two, three months, you might see a dominant bacteria or a different, different wild yeast that was there originally. Um, those cultures are constantly changing, and the more you look at a traditional lambic fermentation process, um, every step in the process, there's a different dominant microbe. So if you want to maintain a house character, um, I would say keep it as a mixed culture, but it's always going to change. You can't dial in a mixed culture exactly the same way every time. But with a pure culture, you can't do that for the most part. So really, I think the, the answer is what's your, what's your end goal and use the methods that are available to you to do those. Yeah, and to tag on what Jeff said there about, um, you know, your culture will change. That's where you need to become a better blender at that point and you need to figure out what it is about that culture that has changed and you know we're assuming here your process is still the same so that your you know kind of loading fruit on your barrel is is the uh is the culture has changed and, you know it has gotten more sack it has gotten more uh, lactic acid uh to it uh so that's why i always invite you know tell people to uh you know if, if it's not coming out then you know make something opposite of how that you know how your uh beer came out and uh, you know, work on your blending skills on that, and that's way you get consistency. Uh, that's something that I've kind of uh, had to do a lot more of this year, 
uh, in the past two years as the uh, sour program's grown and uh, our barrels, uh, especially beers like De Rouge's, uh, where we brew uh, 80 barrels, you know, 80 to 120 barrels of that a year now. And um, to get that blend, to get De Rouge's taste like De Rouge's, as De Rouge's taste, um, it's definitely going through and, and blending. And those barrels, they definitely do not do, we can pitch everything at the same time, and they all came from the same winery, and they're all sitting within two feet of each other, and then they're distinctly different. So that's, you know, that, it's a great opportunity. It's not, a, it's not really a big issue, you know, if you, I, I love to blend. That's one of my favorite things to do about, about my job is, is blending. It's not really get to drink beer at nine o'clock in the morning either. It's just, <laughs> not, it's more the art of it, so. <laughs> do we have a question from anybody out, the, out here? Thanks. Okay, let's get, let's get the microphone so everybody can hear the question. Do we have a spare microphone? Uh, no. no. <laughs> Unless you want us to test this There's two microphones. I mean, we can move through the crowd if we need to. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that might be so. Get <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you guys had any advice on like starting your sour beer programs or like anything you did that you would do differently on a second go around. If we would do anything differently. Yeah, like when you when you started, if there was just like a giant mistake you made or there's something you think you do better. Or in home in home in home brewing, I would definitely say I wish um, I wish I would have dumped more beer. Uh, in the beginning, uh, I know that there was, thinking back on it now, there were definitely batches that, um, that I had in carboys that were, that I took to people's houses and let them taste that thinking back now, I was like, wow, those were probably not very good. Uh, those were definitely probably acetic as, as hell. And, um, you know, they, they just, <clears throat> they just weren't very balanced. So no, I wish I would have done something like that. Um, but in, again, you know, I, was, I just didn't have anybody to tell me. Because at the time, you know, this is one of the big reasons why I started the blog, was the only other real source on the website or on the internet, you could go to the uh, Burgundy of Battle Bell or uh, Mike Tomsmar's site. And that was pretty much it. That was all your choices. And most of the books at that time had so much misinformation in them. So you really couldn't trust, trust what was in the text. So you had to go for these real life, um, uh, just you know, real life examples, and, and learn, you know, work your way through it. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to be in contact with uh, some of the first pioneers of, of American sour brewing. So, you know, thankfully, I, you know, I was able to get advice from you know people that I only hope to attain to reach those levels one day. But things to do it differently. Sure, I wish I would have had somebody to tell me to dump stuff. But nobody was brewing these beers around here, so there was really nobody. You know, there was no real uh, kind of litmus test almost for uh, uh, for what to dump and, and what not to dump. Uh, to me, it was just it was like, oh man, I made you know beer with acidity in it and it had this, and you know, and it didn't kill me. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, the uh, yeah, I, I would just I would encourage to dump more. Yeah, I mean, you spent your Saturday making you know the beer, and then you spent. 10 months aging it and, and then you went to taste it right before bottling and it just it just wasn't that good uh, you know don't don't you know, don't get down on that that that's certain that's not something you should be ashamed of we still dump beer yeah too i mean i still you know i dump barrels upon barrels sometimes i mean it's just the way it is it's it's really no big deal it's not a sign of failure it's not a sign that you're a bad brewer it makes you a better brewer if you if you don't it's the complete opposite. I know, you know, there's, you know, there's definitely a sense of pride in it, and you know, you feel like you wasted your time. But I mean, God, don't waste everybody else's time. Got a question from Dave Jansen. Oh, <laughs> well, wait. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, one thing I, I wish is I was wish I would have started brewing sour beer more often. When I first started, I kind of just did like you know one or two a year. And I really didn't progress in how good I got until I started doing one or two a month. And uh, <clears throat> like anything, you can't learn without practicing. So you can read all you want to about this type of stuff, but if you're not practice, 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 you'll never get better at making anything. So uh, that's kind of why I started into like, quicker sours too, so you can get more feedback uh, a little bit faster. And then also having those long-aged beers, so I might do 
you know, one brew one beer that's going to be aged for a long time per month, and then the three other weeks I'm brewing faster turnarounds hours, so uh, get a lot of practice in. Okay, we got a question from Dave Jansen. Um, how have the, how have y'all's goals, the targets for brewing sour beer changed over the last few years, and how they changed their process to better achieve those goals? And you may have touched on those a little while ago, but right. It, Okay, um, I think uh, one of my big goals lately is kind of how do we make super drinkable sour beer fast, like easy, uh, easier to get to a consumer uh, at like a fair price. Um, so we're not doing like all the time doing like $30 bottles of sour beer, but we can do something along the line of like Berliner Weiss and get uh, more people drinking sour beer. Like I'd like, my, one of my goals is to go to like a tailgating at a football game and see people drinking like, you know, Berliner Weiss or something along that style instead of like a session IPA. Like just, I just want everybody to kind of know about sours, get into them and uh, just make them more accessible. So you would like people to embrace the fun? I would like people to embrace the fun, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I was just reading the question. Um, my goals and targets, um, uh, just I'll speak on, on the uh, pro level and commercial level. Uh, I've tried to soften our beers a lot more. Um, really back off uh, lactic, um, lactobacillus uh, sourness on it. Um, to me, even though no matter how many times we've done stuff, it just still, just lacto, lacto sour tastes like lacto sour to me. Um, I'm not saying that that's what everybody tastes is just to me. So um, I think we've really tried to work on softening uh, our sours and one, one way we've done that is uh, through TA levels and not really paying that much of attention to uh, pH um, and just seeing how the beers actually taste. Uh, just you know, you quickly go over pH versus uh, 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 TA. pH just will tell you the level of acidity in there. It doesn't care how it, how it actually is perceived on the palate. So uh, TA levels actually gives you a measure of how acidic or you know, sour for that matter, how it actually tastes on, on the human palate. Uh, so you can, you're, you're becoming, it can go back to blending, but you can become a better brewer and a better blender by changing that you know, little process like that. Uh, it can, you can buy equipment that's quite expensive or you can do their, uh, their test, I think I spoke on it last year, but there are uh, quick tests you can do that, you know, it'll get you in the ballpark. I mean, it's not going to be precise as, you know, as a digital meter that you have, uh, um, you know, that you have uh, uh, gone through and made sure all the settings are correct. I mean, it'll get you in the ballpark of it, um, the, the quick test, but, you know, you, you can definitely figure out if your beer is sitting at like a, you know, on a scale like a seven or, you know, a, a 12. And you can easily find if you're going through and pulling from barrels, it's pretty easy to uh, see on the color scale what uh, what levels the uh, the acidity is going to be on the palate, and that makes my blends quicker and easier and uh, to go through. Um, that's something else to say on that. But Dan, um, along the lines of Brandon, I'm also trying to curb the acidity on my beers. Um, my culture is really aggressive get really, really sour, as Devin can attest to. Um, and so I'm doing that with hops, um, doing a lot of uh, aged hops or a combination of aged hops and fresh hops. Um, also playing with late hops in, in the work, or you know, when you're making the work. Um, just really light hopping, like a, I'm a, I'm a, home, I'm a home brewer, so on the home brewer scale it's an ounce, you know, a few scant buildings at 10 minutes for a five gallon batch. Um, I don't know. You guys will have to scale that up, sorry. <laughs> um, and also, uh, water chemistry is really interesting to me right now. And uh, I think it's something that is underappreciated in, in sour beers. Um, Andrew Zinn from uh, Wicked Weed is really um, generous with the information that he can. Just talk a little louder. Uh, Andrew Zinn is a little, a little is, Andrew Zinn is, uh, has been very uh, helpful giving some, some hints on what they do at Wicked Weed. They, uh, they use a lot of sulfates, so a lot of gypsum. Um, I don't know the exact amounts, but that's that's just tells you that you know the, the uh, water chemistry uh, can 
play a large role. I think uh, there's also some uh, potential with like limestone or, or chalk bicarbonate. So uh, yeah, those are the, those are the things I've been working. You know, bro. Anybody? Okay, we got a question. Oh, easy. That's, that's a lot of people to go through. Our <laughs> So I've uh, seen a lot of breweries that are getting interested in sours and mixed fermentation, but don't really have like a huge barrel program that they started up. I can't even count the number of breweries I've seen that just have a few barrels of something souring over in the corner in their brewery. Um, and I was just wondering if you guys could speak to maybe some of the uh, some of the different thinking about you know starting a sour program in your brewery, but also just there seems to be a big range of people that are so petrified to have any of those bugs in their brewery. They want to keep it segregated. They want separate facilities. And then you've got brewers that are like, I can kill bread. I can kill lactobacillus. I'll ferment that in this tank. I'm not scared of it at all. If I'll just hit it with more parasitic acid, then that's that. Uh, so I just was wondering if you could kind of speak to maybe some of the myths or misconceptions or how important segregation is with the, uh, you know, sour programs versus, uh, you know, your clean side. Yeah. I can definitely speak on that. Um, so we, uh, I definitely believe that they need to be separate facilities. Um, I, I, I think that even with the best QC, I mean, look at what happened to a brewery like Goose Island, and what happened with uh, with Bourbon County. I mean, it arguably has some of the uh, greatest uh, scientific resources out there in QC and brewing, and they still missed it. Uh, so separate facilities, yeah, we, uh, yeah, so we, we run our sour uh, program at a, uh, at a facility that's about five miles away from the main brewery. And that's not just because we don't think Brett can travel five miles, it's just that's where the facility is. But point being is like, it's not just a garage door separating us. Now for years we did, I, and I think Linus and, and myself and, and Ken Price that uh, runs the uh, quality control lab at Yazoo, mm -hmm. Um, we did feel like we were always running out. It was like an into you. you can run up to the edge of a cliff so many times, and man, you might stop right on the edge six, you know, six thousand times. But all it takes is six thousand and one where you trip and you go right over. And for a brewery our size, if something I was doing got in the line there, say two hundred barrel batch of pale ale, well, that might not get picked up until that is already packaged and sent out and we actually already have another batch that could potentially affect 400 barrels worth of uh, worth of pale ale. Uh, you know, that's more than, you know, some breweries might even make in six months. So, I mean, that's a substantial amount of beer that, um, that would have to be recalled to be a black eye, you know, be a financial financial loss. So I would always say if you, if you have the means and ability, don't count on doubling up parasitic. I mean, the levels of parasitic should I mean, everything that I know from, from like Loeffler where we get our chemicals, um, it, you know, doubling is just wasting at that point. There's a, there's a standard as what will kill um, or, you know, disrupt the cell, you know, the cell walls and membranes and what you should use. I mean, doubling up is, you know, I don't know. It, it's just, to me, that's not what you, um, that's not what you should do. Um, you should concentrate elsewhere. Uh, we, we always ran separate hoses. Uh, we taped everything in red. Uh, so anything red, uh, just in case it got picked up, I always stored the, the uh, Embrace the Funk hoses upstairs at the brewery, but um, everything was taped in red, and that way, just in case somebody just grabs a hose, they, you know, before they go to it up, they would see bright red around there. Um, but I, you know, I think you're really, you're really messing with your flagships, and in this market, in this day and age, with uh, how many uh, SKUs are on the shelf, I mean, do you want to be that guy to lose, you know, lose that world of beer that you had for, you know, six months on there? And that's going to be blank now because you've had to recall two subsequent batches and maybe that, that beer got out to the consumer and they don't like it now. And, you know, you might not get that person back. So, you know, financially, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's a bad, I think it's a bad call. Yeah, way more. I think everything that Brandon said makes perfect sense. And I'm, I'm not a brewer, I don't run a brewery. Um, I can speak from the micro perspective in that there's an assumption that bread is somehow 
the most powerful yeast <laughs> in the world, and only a superhuman could destroy it. Um, it, it can die. Um, Brett has multiple situations where it can kill itself. Um, it's self-destructive. Um, that being said, it has um, an ability to over-attenuate warts, um, and only a few cells can create a significant flavor contribution in a beer. So um, I think I just got to put it in perspective in that a lot of breweries get contaminants um, just from everyday use of, the, of their facility, um, from missing a, a QC point in the process and CIP maybe isn't um, perfect. Um, you have microbes around you all the time um, and you may not know that they're in your beer. Um, so I think it is wise to have a separate facility. Um, that may not be an option for everyone. Um, have a separate room, have separate hoses, have separate gaskets, have separate tanks. But you're probably contaminating your beer right now with other brewing yeast strains, you just don't know it. So unless your sanitation is absolutely impeccable, unless your QC program is absolutely impeccable, um, it's more dangerous to run those in the same place. But if you are just gonna jump into it, if you're gonna go to that edge of that cliff, um, be as smart about it as possible. And just a real touch on that, we did a video yesterday with Jeff um, starting a QC program on a budget, a video that's been posted on the Southern Brewers Conference page. If you guys watch this later or you're out in the audience, it's already been posted on the Southern Brewers Conference page. It'll also be cross-posted on Milk of Funk. So uh, it was very interesting. So, anybody else have a question? Um, okay, we got a question from Josh Kaufman. He goes with got one more. You had something else though about the barrels, right? Oh, no, it wasn't just. Oh, no, I was just saying that I've, I've seen so many breweries that just kind of, there's like three or four barrels over in the corner of something that okay. we decided to sour. And okay. Like, it's, you know, Hard they're, they're just kind of, it, 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 it just seems like <laughs> they're not really fully committed to a sour program, but they're also like not that concerned about uh -huh. bug center there. Well, let me, I, I do want to speak on something about that real quick then, because that does bring up a point um, that, and, and again, it goes, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about things that I would have changed when I first was, when I was first home brewing. Um, breweries that get a get a barrel from a store, and they they have no experience. And I have no problem with people. I mean, all of us all of us at one point had no experience doing this. Um, but just taking like your if you make I don't know like an Irish red and throwing it in the barrel and going up to the homebrew shop and dumping in a couple of packs um, and oversampling it and sending that out. That, that's an issue that I've seen to breweries that aren't fully committed. You don't, I'm not saying you have to go all the way in, but I just, you know, I feel like if I don't say this, then, and then you know, I'm kind of wasting my platform. As somebody that's, that's a full-time sour and wild beer brewer, that this is my livelihood. Um, those types of things uh, make us all look bad. Uh, they're not quality, uh, they're not representative of the styles, and they're, you know, they, they're simply knockoffs most of the time. Um, so yeah, I don't have an issue with anybody making small batch stuff at all. I mean, if you can only do two to three barrels, and, the stuff, and what you're putting out is inspired, and, and it's quality, by all means, you do two to three barrels a year, you know, I'm probably one of the first people in line to drink it, I, you know, but, the but the issue that I that I see more more often is is that uh, the year brewers that are do, taking over and doing these sour projects are doing everything opposite to anything they've been taught and they're always kind of pulling back a little bit on it and they're not creating the best the best product. You don't have to go all in on the program, but please go all in on the on the on the uh, actual project that you're making. That's. And this next question from Josh Kaufman kind of leads into that. He goes, with more and more breweries producing not only kettle sours, but barrel aged sours, do you see the popularity of these styles waning in the coming years due to saturation? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. Just think of how many IPAs you see in the market. It's like insane now. Everyone's brewing a New England IPA. So <laughs> I don't think we're going to hit a saturation point any anytime soon. You're, you're telling us we need to have Berliners and a tailgate party like that. Right. That's not saturation, that's, that's achieving a goal. Right. I don't, um, you know, I think that the, 
think we're still scratching the surface as to what we can actually actually do with these styles and and uh, how we can create different flavors for people. So no, I, I certainly don't. Um, I'd say that the um, you know if anything, uh, you're just going. It's not going to wane or get uh, you know whitewashed or anything. It's they're only be, going to be become better because most consumers now have such a quality selection they can choose from. The uh, shitty ones will get uh, weeded out, and they will learn when they sit on the shelf for a year, year and a half, and the retailer doesn't pick them back up um, that they're not going to brew those styles again. So I think actually your quality is going to go up, and they and they, with the expansion of the quality programs. Uh, the beers will just get better. And also to Milk the Funk. Milk the Funk wasn't here as a resource. How many years ago? Three years ago? Yeah. Um, if you're starting up a program, you have a wealth of knowledge, um, experts, um, the wiki that Dan expertly curates. We didn't have that a few years ago. You know, when I started Bootleg, in some retrospect, like, I went in there flying blind, um, and I know so much more now from my own experience. But I know so much more now because of Milk the Funk um, and these, these gentlemen here. So there's no excuse to go into a program uninformed. Um, educate yourself first before jumping in feet first. Anybody have the audience have a question? Okay. Okay. And thanks for liking it on Facebook, Manny. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to rapid fire for three of you gentlemen. Uh, Jeff, I love that your goal is to have yeast cultures from every zip code. I'd love to know how many zip codes you're up to. Devin, the beer that you brewed last night that used hay was fantastic. I wish you could discuss that. Okay. And Brandon, one of the most enlightening beer experiences of my drinking career was your Breaking Bread uh, event that you did. I'd love for you to discuss that uh, so people could learn about it. Um, we're nearing close to 250 to 300 local yeast cultures now. Um, so we have, I think, 40 to 60,000 zip codes in the U.S. So <laughs> <laughs> we've been going at it strong uh, since 2013. So it's a, it's a lifetime goal to achieve that. Um, it's kind of a, a mission of Bootleg to expand the knowledge of wild yeast and getting science in the hands of home brewers and craft brewers. Um, it's not a money generating enterprise and I don't know many businesses who would take on an audacious project that would never really bring any kind of financial stability to the company. But for me, it's the reason why we do bootleg. It's the reason why uh, I took on the stresses of starting up a business is because I wanted to do something that I thought would hopefully change the world or at least we could contribute something to the, the knowledge um, and the availability of unique microbes to people who want to make interesting beers. The, the beer from last night I made, um, from my presentation uh, yesterday, I was talking about being hyper-experimental. So anytime like a new yeast strain or something comes out, I just buy it. You know, a lot of these uh, homebrew pitch sizes, if you're going to do like uh, test batches or I mean, you're paying 10 bucks plus shipping to get some new yeast strain in, uh, that can change the entire way your beer tastes. So uh, that one was a uh, Hothead, which is a Kivike, is that right there? Yeah, <laughs> it's like a Nordic uh, brewing yeast. So, um, kind of dug into that style of brewing, and uh, actually went to our the library at the university I worked for, and they have a, a book on Nordic brewing from like the '60s. So I went all through that, and then there's another uh, guy named Lars that started a blog where he's kind of going through uh, Norwegian uh, and Scandinavian like brewing traditions. Uh, so one of the things I saw that was pretty interesting, um, I brew on a on my buddy's 600 acre farm, uh, and they have in the Nordic traditions they use hay and juniper as a mash filter. So I just took my cooler and went out in the backyard and got uh, red cedar clippings and then hay from down where the cows are, and uh, just used that as my mash filter, just uh, in like a regular uh, home brew like mash. Time. And uh, that contributed a lot. I, oh, I did also put a uh, red cedar into the strike water, uh, just like a few branches in there. Um, but it, it contributed a lot to the to the beer that I made. And then 
uh, fermented it with the Cubic strain, which is kind of a crazy fermenter that's the, it's from Hothead, from uh, Omega, and it flocks like crazy, and like the yeast like literally stuck to the bottom of the carboy and I had to like blast it out with like water uh, to get it out. But so that dropped almost completely clear, and then I uh, pitched all my stuff on top of it. So it'd be uh, Jeff's uh, PDO blend, and then uh, Lacto P from Good Belly, and then all my bread stuff. I usually keep all collected and repitch every time. Um, that's about it on the one. I can attest that's a great beer. <clears throat> I really like that. Um, so, Maddie asked about the uh, breaking bread series or a presentation that we did so that was kind of a continuation of uh of education um i think we did that maybe about three or four years ago uh so at the, at the time breaking bad was on and so i made the series you know, the logo of breaking bread it was super clever um <laughs> that was cool um and so what we did uh at the time uh, uh this, uh, this gentleman up in New York, uh, Dimitri, had isolated out uh, three different Botanomyces from a bottle of uh, Cantillon iris, and actually brought water with him. Um, he brought, uh, so he showed me down the isolates, and so we brewed a beer, uh, and only for a minute with each one of those isolates in there. And so the whole point was to, was to break, break out the bread and to show the different and distinct qualities because one of the things that uh, one of the uh, descriptors that I always hate is uh, is horse blanket. I know when people describe Britannomyces, you say it's a, a Britannomyces beer, and you're like, oh yeah, I heard that one time, horse blanket. Um, and that just, it just drives me insane because that just sounds so unappetizing and unappealing to me. So we wanted to show the different characteristics of each one of these uh, Britannomyces isolates. And so the three beers, uh, we, we did a presentation on what, uh, you know, what is Britannomyces? Does it actually, you know, does it sour? Does it, uh, or does it make sour beer? Does it always create stuff that tastes like, you know, like a farm? Um, and, you know, we were able to break that out <clears throat> and show that, uh, you know, no, you can get a lot of uh, pineapple. Uh, you can definitely get, you know, licorice out of some of these strains. You can get, uh, you know, a great star innocence, uh, um, black cherry type character out of it. So showing people, and I think we had maybe 50 or 60 people, um, a little bit less that's in this room right now, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, about 50 or 60 people there, and, and being able just to enlighten them on what these microbes do and what they don't do. And so that in, in turn you know, helps them go out into the market and be better informed consumers, uh, brewers, and, uh, and it's, and, you know, I just thought it was a really fun event and to be able just to talk about the differences. And again, I like to talk about what things don't do. You know, I always need to talk about what they, you know, what they do and tell what they, you, sometimes people need to be told what they actually do not do and just dispel those myths. And uh, again, there was, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And that was always a big point of, uh, of Embrace the Funk was to help, you know, just to help people learn. Um, and I always felt like if we could get people to learn about these wonderful styles, the most complex styles on the planet, um, then you can bring them in, you can show them great examples of it, and then they're gonna be the next person to, oh man, I tried this really cool beer, and it had, you know, had this, uh, they had this yeast in it called uh, Covertanomyces, and you know, they tell their friend, and, and, and they get into a discussion, and they, they actually find a commercial example somewhere, and then you've got your, you know, you've got your next new customer, and they help create a whole new customer base, and it's all based upon accurate information. And you related it to them in a way that you're not telling them to taste. I mean, if somebody walked up to you and said, "Hey, what you taste? It tastes like horse blanket." You go, "What the hell are you talking about?" No, that's like this is bad. Is this is milk smell sour? That that's terrible. So when you when you tell people that, they, that these things taste like your pears and and uh, and Granny Smith apples and, and wonderful, wonderful foods, you know, think we can do better on these descriptors. Uh, we, can, we can tell people about these beers that we work on for anywhere from six months to a year. Uh, we've got that long to come up with better descriptors than, than horse blanket and saddle.
I mean, I'm from Kentucky, and I literally have horses in my backyard, and I've never smelled a horse in the bottle before. <laughs> i got a question, and I'm going to let Brandon get on this high horse again, but this is something that's come up on Untapped and um, other things, and it's the term, Brett not sour. Yeah, I mean, that was born, that was literally born of my frustration uh, with creating Botanomyces beers that had that you know that, that were not sour and that was almost kind of like a little reverse troll against but then the beer caught on and uh it's it's just an american ipa uh with a lot of uh i think we use like citra galaxy mosaic in it maybe some centennial um but yeah just all i it's just it's it's like american ipa with uh botanomyces and it's not sour uh it's it's very um it's very tropical it's uh you know it's, it's very dry, I mean, it's the hyperattenuate, like Jeff was talking about, the Britannomyces can definitely hyperattenuate and uh, really dry the beers out. But yeah, it has no sourness to it. So, um, you know, I thought what better way to get people to realize that than just literally call the beer red, not sour, and make them say it. And I feel like you can make them say it, it. That, that, you know, if they're saying it, then maybe it'll stick. Uh, it's like ninety-nine percent of the time that stuck, and I was fine with people actually not liking the beer. But uh, I mean, people did. But the people that didn't, I'm fine with that. I mean, I've never, you know, somebody. It's not your style. It's not your style. I mean, there's plenty of styles I don't like. But if um, you know, if you're liking, if you're disliking it for the right reasons, you know, that's that's an that's an informed person. It's, it truly has a, a valid opinion. And I think it all came from a, a tap posting where a consumer suggested that, yeah, as they dump all the beer because the, the Brett beer wasn't sour, and the name of the beer was Brett Not Sour. It was, it was pretty hilarious, actually. <laughs> it <laughs> so, was. And that was about the time Yeppy was going off on somebody else on one of his untapped things. So it was just the timing was just yeah, exquisite. The was there. I didn't. Uh, Yeppy. <laughs> Send me a message to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. We have an unnamed source asked if you're ever going to make a hot sour, a hot chicken sour beer. <laughs> 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 well, I don't know. Didn't, didn't Yeppy make one? Or is oh, that I don't know. Chicken beer. Fried chicken beer. Yeah. Fried chicken beer, yeah. Well, I guess it, it, I'm sure I'm sure he's watching right now. So uh, <laughs> uh, when he uh, next time he's in Nashville, maybe we can uh, maybe we can make a hot chicken version of that of that recipe. And we'll do it with all bread. <laughs> That'll add to the barnyard character. Uh, okay, and we. All right. So uh, not that long ago, Mantra picked up a cool ship, and then Biazu got a cool ship right after that. So my question is, uh, do you see cool ships becoming a, a new trend amongst uh, breweries that uh, with wild and sour programs? I assume that's for me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, Dan. Uh, I think you know, anybody can speak on the trends of uh, cool ships. Uh, yeah, I'd say as, as more breweries, uh, more commercial breweries are trying to find ways to differentiate themselves uh, from kettle sours and uh, from fast turnaround sours. Uh, cool shipping and local and native uh, microflora is the way to go. Uh, that's kind of what I hit on yesterday uh, was how you know I feel like we've made our uh, our program distinctly different on our on our character uh, just by using local flora in in the mix. Not say we still have other stuff that we get from labs, um, but uh, but yeah, we've definitely mixed in uh, native flora. We found uh, we brewed the first. Uh, 100% spontaneous uh, commercial beer in Tennessee um, six like six years ago. So you know, we, it's nothing really new to us as far as like doing it. It's just we're doing it on a larger scale now uh, with our with our cool ship. Um, ours is kind of designed. Uh, we ours was custom built. Um, we we had it designed to where we could not only do um, overnight uh, cooling and uh, and uh, ambient inoculation. To we can also do. Um, open fermentations in it and uh, we, we've only done one so far open fermentation for folks that don't open firm as is, uh, kind of hit on earlier on I said what Bob does but um, it's ours is a large square pan uh, and uh, 
our, we built the, the uh, walls up on it so we can you know go uh, ferment for two to three days and the croissant will not you know go foaming out um, so that's kind of you know we could actually do a true fermentation so just let instead of just using it as a cooling device it's also can be a fermenter so you think the, uh, 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 geometry of that fermentation vessel also plays a factor in the flavors you're getting. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, the Devin asked the uh, geometry of the uh, of the cool ship and the fermenter. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're fermenting in a shallow, you know, if you're fermenting in a shallow square rectangle um, uh, container, as opposed to having you know a conical, where if you if you ever looked at yeast when it's when it's going, you know, drops and it starts flocculating down. Uh, you can actually get a vortex going inside of the uh, inside of the conical. That's kind of the main reason to have a conical is to keep knocking you know the yeast up. You know you get quicker, healthier, better attenuations, uh, and then you know when it does drop, you know it forms a nice cone at the bottom uh, to be able to, to pack down. But uh, you don't really get that in a um, uh, in an open fermenter that is a large, you know, square shallow pan. So yeah, you get distinctly uh, different uh, esters and, uh, and characters out of the out of the yeast that you would not get inside of a closed um, inside of a closed fermenter. So it's definitely yeah, it's, it's definitely a tool that we that we've been able to uh, you know I think the design of it we were able to, we're able to utilize ours um, you know, to any year round. You know, it's not a tool that we can only use during. A certain season and it just sits in the way the rest of the year or you know just collects dust i mean we you know, we purposely did it that way and because I mean, it's, it just doesn't make sense to me to have this beautiful piece of equipment and this fun piece of equipment if you can only use it you know, four months out of the year when that's not our main focus um, you know we're not 100 percent spontaneous for many brewery so you know i still need to make other beers throughout the year that are unique and you get these cool ideas or you have these cool locations you can go maybe there's like a neat ingredient that uh that you can finally source and you think oh, that would go really well with this yeast and you know open firm is you know is, is the way to go i think on some of those recipes so yeah just to make things uh different uh more fun uh but local uh native flora you know jeff can speak on this you know there's just so many there's so many untapped variants of it out there that are undiscovered nobody's using and, and they're right there they're, the, the beauty of it is that if you got the equipment the the, the floor is free you know? <laughs> and i like the fact that both y'all mantra and yourself y'all are portable you can actually take your cool ships out into a field or an orchard or whatever and try to capture that floor too so i actually have a question I want to throw it to Dan. Um, I feel like the, the wiki is such a fantastic resource, and I was hammering on this earlier about how we as a community have so much more readily available knowledge. Um, that There are sour brewers right now who are very well acclaimed that go to the wiki regularly to answer questions. And so I guess it's more of an open question to you, Dan, is what would you say that maybe in the past year that you know, you've learned from pulling together all these studies and everyone's experience that you think the community has now actually have more available knowledge to them now um, just because of the work that's been put into the wiki and what people have contributed? Well, thank you, Jeff. That was a, a big question. <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I, I tend to focus a little bit more on the science stuff um, than, the, than the process stuff, especially on the commercial side. Um, I think one of the big things on, on the microbiology level is uh, looking at how different microbes interact with each other during fermentation and how they affect each other. Um, I mean, we all know like the basics that lactic acid inhibits, uh, you know, Saccharomyces, that Britannomyces is more tolerant of lactic acid. Um, but there's, there's also really weird things that are going on. Like for example, lactic acid can also inhibit um, I can't remember the, so we, we all know that, that Saccharomyces ferments uh, simple sugars first, and then it ferments the uh, more complex sugars next. The presence of lactic acid turns that off so that they're fermenting all the sugars at the same time. And it's just a really weird thing, you know. Um, I think we're gonna see a lot more of that going forward in science. Um, I think that's, unfortunately there's not a lot of money 
in science for this, so it's very slow. Um, but talking to people like Richard Price, um, that's really some of the more interesting things that we have yet to learn. Anybody else have any questions out in the audience? We're almost to the end of time here, but um, just I want to get y'all's feelings on the nomenclature of sour beer. You know, we have um, mm -hmm. the lambic and the method goose, and what's that say? Is that, is that oh, yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and of course, now the latest thing I read the other day is that down the, the Belgium and French areas want to try to hook up on, take the word Saison from the Everybody, so just want to get y'all's feeling about that because that, that's a topic that it's brought up on both the fun, so might as well hit it. Um, I've actually, I'm not one for going hard on like this has to be exactly this to call it this, but I personally have moved away from uh, from naming conventions like that. I've been starting to call my stuff just like a golden sour. Um, I think those labels kind of. Uh, put you in a box or kind of inhibit uh, what you're doing. I I really don't like to brew to a certain style. Like I'm, even like if I'm brewing a Saison type, I, I still don't think I'm hitting what Saison really is. So uh, for me personally, I'm trying to uh, brew my own beer. I'm not trying to brew, you know, some person in Belgium's beer. I'm trying to figure out uh, how as American brewers we can take uh, Things that are around us and uh, technique, newer techniques, and make it make our own completely new thing. Like uh, I, I just don't want to put myself in a box as far as brewing style. So um, I'm trying to think how to answer this. <laughs> I definitely have thoughts. If you want to yeah. <laughs> So I think that, uh, you know, Americans have this way of thinking about beer that's very influenced from Germany, from German brewing. Uh, it's all about styles, right? And um, sour beer really throws a wrench into that because it's, it's so unexplored, like Evan was saying, and things are constantly changing. So, you know, on one level, you have to respect what's, what's been done before you. Um, so, you know, calling your beer a lamb because, uh, personally, I, I have a problem with that. I don't think anybody should call their beer a lambic. I've seen arguments, heard arguments that, you know, the, even the lambic brewers don't really adhere to their own traditions, you know, with throwing bananas and lambics and, you know, not really doing 100% spontaneous fermentation and things like that. But, you know, what, what they do is what they do. Leave that argument for them uh, to decide amongst themselves. Um, you have another one with uh, farmhouse sales. Uh, American brewers will call anything with wheat in it um, in a saison yeast. They'll either call it a saison or a farmhouse sale. Well, if you talk to somebody like Lars Garshaw, uh, who Devin mentioned earlier, um, his definition of a farmhouse sale is completely different because there's people living in Norway uh, who are brewing using the same tradition that they've that they've done for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, to them, that's a farmhouse sale. Um, so, I mean, this subject is, is, is really vast. The whole thing about even calling something a sour beer, you know, that, that can also be a whole other discussion. Um, so th th this, is a, this is like a, a really big problem. It covers uh, marketing, I think, on the commercial brewers level, uh, covers competitions covers, uh, you know, how people think about beer in general. Um, so it's, it's an impossible question to answer. That's why I asked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of my response. There, I don't know, there's, there's no, I don't think there's any really good answer right now. There just needs to be more open dialogue without, um, without people catching fields over everything. <laughs> Um, I, I would rather see cooler heads prevail in some of these discussions. They don't have to be argue, arguments, just let them be discussions. Uh, that's, that's what I would like to see in this. Um, you know, I think the question might be a little bit loaded just because I think it, it's, it's referring mostly, mostly to uh, method goose, um, which is the, definitely the hot, hot button. Um, I mean, 
it's it's something that I believe that the the terminology and what Jeffrey was trying to do with Method Goose, I think his heart and mind is absolutely in the right place for it because Jeff gets it. He's traveled to Belgium. Um, I know that he, you know, I know he put a lot of thought into uh, in, into MG. So, you know, I, I don't think it was ever, I mean, to me, I always viewed it as something, as Method Goose was something that, that the Lambert producers probably should pay more attention to um, and not immediately dismiss because I do believe it is something that you're trying to say the same thing. You're trying to make the designation that you're not making Lambic here, you're only doing it inspired. You know, it's just an inspiration from it and that's, you know, just to get the point across for it. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think they're saying, they're, you're trying to protect the same thing, that's, that's the way I viewed it. It was, it was two different, you know, two different schools of thought trying to, uh, you know, trying to protect and, um, and make distinction against, uh, you know, it make distinction, I'm sorry, for the same thing. You know, so basically, you know, lab pit 